All right, so welcome back to another video where I work towards the JNCIE SP exam. So in the last video, we ran through all the verification commands. We had lots of issues with the neighborships not establishing, but that's because there were issues with the documentation saying to use neighbor addresses that are very clearly incorrect because the only addresses configured on the interfaces in this topology are done so with EUI-64 extended unique identifier and that uses a special method to construct a unicast address that will include FFFE in the middle of the address and you can see there is no FFFE in any of these math addresses so these are clearly not valid neighbor addresses but we were able to figure that out send it out to the friendly folks at Juniper to get that fixed eventually hopefully then we were able to do a deep dive wire short capture and uh, everything from what I understand went fine I, I believe we did all the verification commands I actually don't really remember um, can just do them again quick. But yeah, it's I think I'm making good progress. I'm planning to take the test in uh, September. Right now it is March. So I've got half of March and then oh actually it's April. So I got less time than I thought, but I've got Half of April, then um, May, June, July, August, September. So hopefully that'll be plenty of time to prepare, to prepare. So, yep, I remember doing all this. So this video I think is going to be the start of the next topic. Just do a show route quick. So the next, well, actually, no, it's going to be the same topic, which is just IBGP and EBGP peering, but it's going to be the next subject within this topic, which is going to be IBGP peering instead of EBGP peering. So one thing I wanted to kind of talk about is the different kinds of attributes you can have for a BGP route, you can have transitive attributes, you can have non-transitive attributes, you can have well-known attributes, you can have optional attributes. So I was hoping to kind of dive into that here somehow, but let's just do a quick Google search for BGP attributes. And now we can see Aha, so well-known attributes, as I said, optional attributes, non-transitive attributes. So this looks like a really good resource just to kind of brush up on that quick. So there are, well, I'll just read the whole thing. BGP attributes are pieces of information that a BGP router attaches to describe different prefixes included in its BGP update messages. There is a variable sequence of BGP attributes in every update message, except for those that carries only withdrawn routes. Each attribute is a TLV, which I believe stands for type length value, but that could be wrong. I actually might need to jump to a different source because if they're just going to use acronyms without saying what they stand for it's really not going to be a very useful source so bgp attributes we'll search for that again and, and maybe look and see if there's a a better source that's not going to just kind of leave you hanging with uh with attributes or make you do another google search for it uh, this one looks promising. Uh, another thing, you know, as I, I keep saying, straight to the RFC itself is usually not a bad bet. 
sometimes it can get a little bit out of scope to what you want to use it for, but often it actually is a good resource. And Wikipedia can be good too, but let's, let's, let's try the RFC first because that, ah, here we go. We've got a whole section for path attributes. This section describes the path attributes of the update message. Path attributes fall into four separate categories, well-known mandatory, well-known discretionary, optional transitive, optional non-transitive. So perfect, RFC to the rescue. Well-known attributes must be recognized by all BGP implementations. Some of these attributes are mandatory and must be included in every update message. Others are discretionary and may or may not be sent in a particular update message. Which well-known attributes are mandatory or discretionary is noted in the table below. All well-known attributes must be passed along after proper updating, if necessary, to other BGP peers. In addition to well-known attributes, each path may contain one or more optional attributes. It is not required or expected that all BGP implementations support all optional attributes. The handling of an unrecognized optional attribute is determined by the setting of the transitive bit in the attribute flags octet. Unrecognized transitive optional attributes should be accepted and passed along to other BGP peers. If a path with unrecognized transitive optional attribute is accepted and passed along to other BGP peers, the partial bit in the attribute flags octet is set to one. If a path with recognized transitive optional attribute is accepted and passed along to other BGP peers and the partial bit in the attribute flags octet is set to one by some previous AS, it is not set back to zero by the current AS. Unrecognized non-transitive optional attributes should be quietly ignored and not passed along to other BGP peers. New transitive optional attributes may be attached to the path by the originator or by any other AS in the path. If they are not attached by the originator, the partial bit in the attribute flags octet is set to one. The rules for attaching a new non-transitive optional attributes, the rules for attaching new non-transitive optional attributes will depend on the nature of the specific attribute. The documentation of each new non-transitive optional attribute will be expected to include such rules. The description of the inter-AS metric attribute gives an example. All optional attributes, both transitive and non-transitive, may be updated, if appropriate, by ASs in the path. The order of attributes within the path attributes field of a particular update message is irrelevant. The same attribute cannot appear more than once within the path attributes field of the particular update message. And the following table specifies attribute type code, attribute length, and attribute category for path attributes defined in this document. Okay, so these I think will will look very familiar from the those Wireshark captures. If, I'm going to start another one of those, and I believe there was in the update messages we were seeing before there was path attributes. So let's put this side by side with Wireshark capture and take a look at those path attributes. So it's kind of slow to come up, but it's still established. So, ah, here we go. Now we're not gonna get any updates. We're just gonna get keep alive messages and there won't be any path attributes in there, just, just keep alive. So if we wanna get an update message, 
we're going to need to create a loopback and then we're going to need to create a policy to redistribute that loopback into BGP. And this was done in a previous video. Hopefully I can, let's see, show configuration, pipe display set, pipe no more. So we've already got a loopback configured and but it's not going to be redistributed from a connected route into a BGP route. So let's set up a policy to that. So edit policy options, policy statement, loop back into BGP. Then we're gonna set term one from, and we're gonna say, uh, instead of specifying the protocol, let's just make sure that we're not accidentally putting in more addresses than we intend. So let's specify the particular address we want advertised into BGP for IPv6. So here we go. So to do that, we're gonna need to use a route filter, which is a list of routes to match. So from route-filter, and then it's going to be exact. So let's go ahead and that, that exact keyword is gonna go afterward. Well, well, I guess you can put it either before or after, but let's put it before. And then this is going to be the address. Perfect. So now we need another term. Uh, so it's going to be term one, then except set term one, then except now for ACLs, you of course have an implicit deny any any. But if you've learned anything about Python and if you like the philosophy of Python programming as I do, regardless of what is implicit, there's really no cost to making it implicit. And there's a benefit that you get to see exactly what it does without any kind of special privilege knowledge or any kind of deeper understanding of, of what's going on. You, you save yourself from, from having to kind of think back, oh, how, what was that convention again? And you save all your coworkers too. And really there's no, there's no cost, especially when you're on a computer and you can just type out fast and stuff to including extra characters, especially if you do get the benefit of clarity from those extra characters. There's in fact benefit to including them. So let's set a term two. And it's going to be then deny or reject, sorry, reject. There you go. So here's the policy. If it's from route filter, so if it's this exact route, which is on the loopback address, we're going to accept it. If it's anything else, we're going to reject it. So now we've got to apply it to BGP. And of course we've got to, we can, we can apply it to all neighbors or we can apply it to a specific neighbor. Let's apply it to a specific neighbor, the neighbor going to router A. I'm not sure if these are in order, so I'm gonna to need to look up the neighbor address. So, oh, and of course it's a EUI extended unique identifier address. So that's going to be here. And it's kind of funny what I learned in the last video, MAC addresses are EUI addresses, <laughs> extended unique identifier addresses, just 48 bit MAC EUIs, 64 bit EUIs. Those are used for IPv6 addresses which of course is not 64 bits, but it's how you can build a 
124 bit because bit 128 bit address out of 64 bits is by specifying the first 60 bits manually and then just adding that keyword EUI-64 and then you can auto generate to those next 64 bits. So you can save yourself quite a bit of configuration by doing that and, and guarantee that you have unique addresses. Okay, so it's gonna be 4A02. So let's move over to E, 4A02, it is the one on top. There we go. So now let's do set policy, routing policy. And this is, this is where that question mark is really a best friend. I actually don't remember what the command is. Of course, you're just going to go faster if you can remember it. So it is important at some level to remember what the policy is. But uh, okay, so what we need to do is export that policy. And it's going to be loop back into BGP. And we're exporting it because even though we're putting it into BGP, we're sending it out. So, so we're putting it into a Docker, to a, to a shipping container, yes, but we're then sh sending that shipping container out to another country or to an address. So it's an export, it's not an import, it's not something we're receiving from somewhere else, it's something where we have and we're sending out somewhere else, so it's an export. Commit and quit, and now we'll see a update message. I think I'll maybe verify that this is still running before I hit the commit, and I won't quit, I'll just stay in here so I can roll back and recommit if there is an issue with that. Um, I mean, there's no harm in starting a new capture, it's just a few seconds lost, but that is, Okay. All right, so now it's time to look at that update message and we'll see what kind of path attributes have been included in it. And it'll be important to know because you're going to have different path attributes depending on whether it's eBGP or IBGP. In eBGP, you will have Tran transitive path attributes, but in IBGP you will have non-transitive attributes because transitive is kind of your clue word. Transitions, um, you know, tra transition or, or, or transit, transit. Like when you transit somewhere, or, or transit is is a system to go like city to city. I mean, let's just look up the word transit. And uh, you can see why that's such a, a good clue as to what it means. So, oh, we've got include definition is too common a word. So the carrying of people, goods, or materials from one place to another. So in BGP, what is a place? Well, it's an autonomous system. So a transitive attribute carries information from one autonomous system to another autonomous system. Therefore, they happen over eBGP connections. If it occurs in the same autonomous system, it's going to be over an iBGP connection and it's going to be non-transitive information. So it's just kind of an example how sometimes the terminology just kind of gets more complicated than the concepts sometimes. So it's really not a difficult concept, it's just kind of a difficult terminology, especially if you're not uh, kind of, if, if you're a little bit different than I am and aren't uh, kind of a, somebody who's really into like language and words and really likes, uh, kind of is interested in, in new vocabulary and stuff, it can be an extra challenge. Oops, and it looks like the Wireshark is not booting up, but I think we can go ahead and do, do some commits. So commit that, roll back, commit it, roll back one, commit, 
All right. So now, I'm, so unfortunately, it was some extra time lost, but it would have been that time plus extra time if it was in fact not capturing anymore. So, okay. And now E is where I'm going to set that up where I had that rollback. So now I'm going to start the capture and we're going to get an update and then we'll see the path attributes, including the transitive path attributes in the update message. So I just got to do a rollback one. And then once the, I can see the captures running, just a commit, which is running, commit. And now there'll be an update. All right, so I don't see an update, which is interesting. I do see a, a notif. Okay, so it hadn't it hadn't opened yet. Ah, here's an update. So that's kind of interesting because you can see it, it had keep alive messages, but there's this notification message here. So I wonder if, I wonder what, uh, okay. Yeah, I think, I think it was forming a new neighborship. Maybe because I restarted the lab, it didn't have all of the neighborships formed yet. So this is that race condition because I don't have the passive knob toggled. So you can see here's a four-way disconnect. So it looks like the source address. So that was sending these these keep alives dot two lost that race condition. So it disconnected, and now we've got a new sin synac ac three-way handshake. Ah, oh, but it's from dot two. So Oh, but it's from, okay, so it ends in the, they both end in zero two, but one is 9D, the other one's 4A. So yeah, you can see 4A backed off. Um, at least it appears, it appears like that's what happened, but uh, I guess I'm not 100% sure on that. But the focus right now is this update message. So let's take a look at the path attributes right here. So we've got NP unreach, NLRI is a path attribute. And you can see, oh, that's interesting. It's non-transitive too. So might have to um, kind of dive in deeper. I mean, that's the whole point of this, this video is to really learn what those means. And if I have misconceptions about what they mean, that, that's the point of the video is to overcome those misconceptions and find out what is actually true. So the transitive bid is not set. The optional bid is set. Uh, hopefully, well, let's see. So this is packet 24. So I'm curious what's going to happen if I do that again. So roll back one show pipe compare so this will take that address out so let's do another rollback one oops and for some reason it looks like i can't well oh i'm no longer in commit code mode because i did commit and quit so roll back one again show pipe compare and then let's get a fresh capture and hopefully I will see an update message. Ah, oh, that's interesting. It it almost seems like the commit that um, that introduces a new route into BGP is causing the 
connection to flap is causing it to get a finac for some reason. But in any case, it looks like it was able to successfully add that route. You can see we've got some path attributes. These are the same unreach though, which, which we'll be looking for reach attributes. Really surprised. Ah, here we got some reach attributes. So network layer, ah, perfect. So here it is. And it's, it's interesting that there's non-transitive uh, updates for a eBGP connection. That's, I mean, we looked at the word transit and it's pretty clear that that would actually not be intuitive if it were true. So, So let's look at uh, each one by one. So origin, the origin path attribute defines the origin of the path information. The data octet can assume the following values. So if it's a IBGP, it's going to have a value of zero. If it's an EBGP, it's going to have a value of one. So we would think this would have a value of one. Let's check. And this is the origin attribute, which we have here. Aha, so here's the clue right there. Why is this a non-transitive? Well, it looks like the origin attribute is IBGP. So we've got, let's see here. So there's the, the one it looks like. Yeah, or, or actually this looks like it, yep, the one. So AS path, the AS path attribute enumerates the ASs that must be traversed to reach the networks listed in the update message. Since an AS identifier is two octets, the length of an AS path attribute is twice the number of ASs in the path. So this should be four rules for constructing an AS path attribute are discussed in section nine. So let's see if we've got an AS path. Sure enough, we do. So length is gonna be, you'd think four based on the length of an AS path attribute is twice the number of ASs in the path and there's gonna be two ASs in the path, but looks like the, the length is actually six, so it's almost like it's expecting there to be three in the path, but you can see it almost looks like there's there's just one in the path. So that's interesting. Uh, here we can see that it is transitive for the path attributes. And it looks like the, ah, okay. So the MP reach NLRI, that's non-transitive, but the AS path is transitive and that's, that's important to know, like transitive, non-transitive does not apply to all the path attributes of a BGP message. It's just these, it's like, like if I'm packing up my suitcase, you know, I'm, I'm gonna just bring a change of clothes depending on how many days I'm gonna be on vacation. I'm not gonna bring my whole wardrobe. So it's the same idea. You're only going to bring your transitive attributes across to the next AS, and you're not going to bring your non-transitive attributes. So this MP reach NLRI is not going to be brought across the AS. Okay. So Let's move on to the next one, next hop. The next hop path attribute defines the IP address of the border router that should be used as the next hop to the networks listed in the update message. This border router must belong to the same AS as the BGP peer that advertises it. Okay, so here's kind of the main thing. And we've got the AS 
path attribute. Uh, oh, sorry, the, the next hop attribute. So it looks like we're missing the next hop attribute, or at least it's not. Maybe it's nested under a different. Oh, huh, OK. Well, I don't see the next hop attribute, which is interesting. I do have the actual route here. Ah, here we go. So here's the here's the next hop network address. So it looks like we are getting the next hop, but it's just not showing up as a path as its own path attribute the same way origin AS and AS path had been. So th that's interesting. Um, but we can see one thing that's interesting is it's, it's of course going to be the, the neighbor. It looks like it's got two choices. It's going to be the, the link local address that begins in FE80 or the, the neighbor address, which begins with the prefix designated for documentation purposes. Okay, so unreachable, the unreachable attribute is used to notify that a to notify a BGP peer that some of the previously advertised routes have become unreachable. So we're definitely going to see that attribute. If I were to go ahead and roll back this change. So I think I'm going to do that now. Hopefully the capture is still running. I have a feel it, feeling it isn't, but we'll see. And then we'll see that unreachable attribute be included in the next update. But unfortunately, yes, the capture was no longer running. So I'm just going to pull it back again and commit and then get a fresh capture and start it again. Yeah, I really wish there was a way to have that work more reliably because it is a little bit of a, there's a, a really good quote I read recently that is, or I actually saw in a presentation about the editor, Linux editor, Vim, that typing is not the bottleneck. It's not how fast you can type. It's, you know, working with computers, it's not about that. It's not about how fast you can type. It's not about how fast you can click. It's not about what shortcuts you know, anything like that. Thinking is the bottleneck. So anytime you've got to break your chain of thought, you've got to say, oh, I wanted to look at this packet. I wanted to see how this works, but dang it, the capture didn't go. I've got to you know, stop thinking. I've got to pull up, do something I, I didn't expect to do. My whole chain of thought is now kind of put on hiatus until I can figure out this other issue. That's your bottleneck, and that's what's really going to slow you down. So being able to have consistent, long, maintained thoughts that are not broken and that, that you kind of work with and build over time, that's what gets you going and really keeps you ahead of, of uh, kind of on your game and really uh, working most optimally. It's not about how many shortcuts you know, it's not about how fast you type, it's not about the kinds of tools you use, it's about how well you can think. And if you can't think because there's a tool that everyone else loves, but it just makes you kind of think less optimally, don't use it. That's what I say. I mean, ideally, we would all be experts in whatever tool uh, was, was the recommended tool in the field. But for instance, myself, uh, from what I understand, there's a lot of benefit to IDEs. But when it comes to Python, sometimes I just got to give up the IDE and, and use Notepad++ or something because if the IDE freezes, if it tells me there's a linting error for something that you know I'm just putting there because I, I just want to think for a bit. I don't want to 
I know I'm making an error. I just want to kind of think about what I'm doing and I, I'm not completing the code. You know, that can interrupt my train of thought and thinking is, is definitely the bottom, bottleneck. So, but of course, one thing you've got to keep in mind though, is these tools like IEEs and Vim and stuff are designed with the intent to aid you in your thinking and have that be less of a bottleneck. So if you can learn them to use them, you can kind of learn the language of them and you can kind of shape your thinking to be more compatible with the strategies they have laid out for you. You can overcome that break in your thinking bottleneck and actually have your speed and efficiency improved and just kind of uh, really perform better than, than you would have performed if you hadn't learned those, those new tools that are there specifically to help you perform better. So, all right, so now let's look at the path attribute for uh, it's uh, unreachable, the unreachable path attribute. And I don't see it. It looks like it could be the unreach. So MP unreach, I am using MP BGP instead of just regular old BGP. So let's see actually if there's a RFC for MP BGP. Yep, and there is multi-protocol extensions for BGP-4. Now let's see how the path attributes differ here. Aha, so now we can see an update message that carries the MP reach NLRI. So these are aligning more with what we're seeing and that's because I'm not using regular old BGP, I'm using MP BGP, which is what is used. So, you know, it's the difference between OSPF version one, which I think is a thing in OSPN version two, or, or, or something that definitely is a thing, RIP version one versus RIP version two. There's really no reason to use RIP version one because of the scalability issues with it sending out the whole routing table every 30 seconds. You're gonna wanna use the capabilities you get with version two where it's more of a distance vector or more, it's more of a, a link state protocol and it, it remembers your routes that it has received before and it only responds to real-time changes and it doesn't just send things out without any memory of, of what it already has. So it kind of knows when it's saying something it has already said before. And hopefully there's a quick kind of confirmation of that, but maybe the word link state, aha. So, yep, so here we go. So when RIP, with RIP, a router sends its full routing table to all other connected routers every 30 seconds. Triggered updates can also occur if a router goes down before the 30 second timer has expired. RIP performs routing by rumor and is more prone to loops than other routing protocols. That's because a RIP router sends its entire table to every other router. All other routers do the same and because there's no real neighbor relationship or calculation of routes, the routers have little first-hand knowledge of available networks. Because of this, it can turn out like the old telephone game you used to play as a kid. At the end of the game, the resulting message is usually quite different from the original. This type of problem can affect RIP because unlike OSPF, a link state protocol, so RIP is, is not a link state protocol. I was pretty sure that was incorrect, which is why I'm reading this, I believe it's a distance vector, or sorry, RIP version two is a distance vector protocol. RIP version one clearly isn't 
doesn't have any of kind of that functionality. It just spams out its full routing table every 30 seconds, regardless of if those entries are still valid or not. RIP routers don't calculate their own routes. They must trust their neighbor's routes. RIP version two boasts the following enhancements. Support for variable length subnet masks, VLSM. Because of this, RIP doesn't assume all networks are classful. So this is another ridiculous thing about RIP version one. If you have the network 10.10.1 slash 24, well, that's a class A address. So all that's going to be sent is 10.0.0.0 slash eight and that's obviously not specific enough because the router routes based on the most specific match so if you've only got eight network bits to to choose from you're really not going to be able to get that specific and your routing isn't going to be very intelligent so having vlsm subnet masks can allow your router to make a lot more intelligent routing decisions so it also has multicast routing updates and it has authentication with encrypted password for routing updates. So I think that's kind of the functionality it has. It doesn't really have distance vector like EIGRP. I kind of thought it did. So let's take a look and maybe I can see where my confusion was or my or my kind of mistaken thinking about that. So so it definitely doesn't have distance vector. Oh okay. Yeah it is a distance vector routing protocol. That's that's what I thought. Yeah, and it uses hop count as a routing metric. So, yeah, and then, okay. And distance vector routing, kind of a, a short explanation of what that is. Aha, here we go. So a distance routing Distance vector routing protocol in data networks determines the best route for data, data packets based on distance. Distance vector routing protocols measure the distance by the number of routers a packet has to pass. One router counts as one hop. So some distance vector protocols also take into account network latency and other factors that influence traffic on a given route. So, yep, RIP is definitely a distance vector routing protocol. It uses hop count. All right. And then, of course, there, there's link state routing protocols as well, that instead of using the hop count or the distance of a route, it has a whole map of the routing table and makes decisions based on the shortest path to any given route. Based on the cost of the link. So a distance vector, of course, chooses the, the best path to the route as well, but it does it based on the distance, so like the hop count. And uh, if there's a hop count of three over 10 gig links, but a hop count of one over a T1 link, 1.544 megabits per second, it's gonna go over the T1 link, which is not ideal. If you have something like a link state protocol, it will see the link state of all your links and be able to choose those 10 gig links because it's going to go a lot faster through those. All right, so, all right, and we moved over to the next, RFC because this is just plain old BGP. It's not NP BGP. So, and you can even see the RFC number is quite low. So MPG, MP BGP is a lot newer. So, all 
And let's see here. Let's do a, a different search. So we're going to do this and then RFC. And hopefully there's kind of a, a better RFC about this that goes into more detail about this specific path attribute. And it is a path attribute. We can see Wireshark considers it a path attribute. But yeah, so it looks like So this is an optional non-transitive attribute that can be used for the following purposes, to advertise a feasible route to appear, to permit a router to advertise the network layer address of the router that should be used as the next hop to the destinations listed in the network layer reachability information field of the MPNLRI attributes. Let's we'll see if we have that. MPNLRI, Network Layer Reachability Information. There's path attributes, and this is on reach. Oh, and we're looking at reach, so that's not gonna be useful. Let's see if there's a section for unreach. Oh, and there is. This is a, another optional non-transitive attribute that can be used for the purpose of withdrawing multiple feasible routes from service. All right, so this is definitely a, an RFC that's going to be more um, relevant to what we're doing specifically. Okay, so that's kind of a tangent. For eBGP, I just wanted to have a better understanding of well-known attributes, optional attributes, mandatory attributes, transitive path attributes. So here we go. Well-known mandatory, well-known discretionary, optional transitive, optional non-transitive. So I wanted to have a better understanding of that. So we can see, of course, Cisco has its own best pass selection. Juniper is going to be a bit different. It's important to know because you will have to toggle some of these attributes in order to get the best route. I'm sure that's going to be on the test. They're going to want you to look at the MED multi exit discriminator discriminator or something like that so there should be some information about that oh not in the original i the original so multi exits med huh that's interesting there's nothing about the med MED BGP RFC. So, this looks pretty good. Multi exit discriminator. Potatoes, that's interesting. Cold potato routing. Hot potato routing versus cold potato routing. All right, well, I think that's a good signal to kind of move on. <laughs> I'm kind of getting a bit too far in the weeds. And of course, I've got 80 topics to go through. So I don't want to spend too much time on any one given topic. So time to move on. Yeah, once you start learning about potatoes, I think it's time to kind of move on to the next topic. All right, so edit text. And one thing I found is kind of reusing routers is, is a little bit of a recipe for disaster. So yeah, it takes more time to 
tear down your lab and build up the brand new one, enter your license keys, enter the startup config, but you're going to save your of time overall because you're not going to be dealing with issues of having stale routers. So it's really, it's no fun to do it, but I think it's the kind of best way. All right, and usually it takes a reboot. So hopefully this is blank now. Perfect, so, oh, that's not blank. This is another kind of bug with GNS. It doesn't successfully delete them all. But it's just a matter of deleting them again, and continuing to do that until they're all gone. Perfect, okay, so now they're all deleted. So we're gonna need six routers. I like to start with the forwarding planes. Oh, and another kind of trick is when you change the host name, it will change the position of the label. So there's no sense in repositioning the label until after you have change the host name. There might be a way to change the default position of the label. And I'm actually, I think I'm going to do that because that would probably save me a little bit of time. So I can change the symbol. Looks like I'm losing connection with my lab. Not sure what that's about. If I can browse. Oh, it probably has to do with, it just needs to do some extra work to get those, to get those up and running. All right, so now I've, of course, got to rename all these, and then I can go on to the control planes. Don't need to be that big. I just need to see the documentation. So, Biloxi, Biloxi, Mississippi, or Biloxi, Tennessee. B I L O X I. Then Memphis. So it's going to be, let's rename Fording Plane 2 to Memphis. All right, and then Jackson, that's going to be three. All right, so now it's time for Miami and Atlanta. Are they close to each other? I thought. get up Google Maps and kind of figure this out. Yeah, that's what I thought. Miami and Atlanta are pretty far apart. That's a, a long connection for a IVGP link, I think. Let's see how far apart the Atlanta to MPLS EVGP link is. Or not to MPLS, to um, Memphis. I don't remember. Memphis. Oh, yeah, it's much, much shorter, so. And of course, it's just a lab, so it might not be, <clears throat> might not be, you know, it's not, definitely not, I think, a, a recommendation for how you configure your production lab. Those choices are going to need to make, be made on your own. Now, of course, it's going to have to do with latency. It's going to have to do with where you can actually put a, a router geographically, where you 
own the real estate for it, all, all that sort of stuff. All right, so, and of course you don't have to own the real estate for it, you can always rent rack space. All right, so Miami, let's make that right of four. Oops, and I actually made a bit of a mistake. Well, actually not too bad because I can just, because you can't have the same name for the forwarding plane as the control plane. So I kind of thought I made a mistake because I wanted to use this casing for the control plane, but I can just use all uppercase for the control plane. It's, it's perfectly fine. And then I can make the system name whatever I want to make it and I'll make it the casing that is used for the forwarding plane. All right, time for the control planes. I think I'll just rename them all as they come. All right, Atlanta and Topeka, Kansas are next. Yeah, it's kind of a lot to configure new devices, but I find it actually works more reliably this way and just troubleshooting VM issues on reliable devices is kind of a bit of a, a hassle. But we're almost there as far as getting the lab topology set up. And of course we're gonna to need to get a initial config on all of these before we can even go ahead and do the lab. So I'll save the reading until the lab is set up. And of course, I'll, I'll go ahead and do a lot kind of between videos. Oops, and it looks like the naming on this is wrong. I must have spelled Topeka wrong. Yeah, I spelled Tokika there. So I'm gonna change this to all uppercase. Good thing I spelled Tokika, otherwise there would have been an error. And then I will rename this and then you'll see it changes my positioning. Okay, so now what I like to do is just overlap them like this. So you've got a little bit of the control plane, forwarding plane sticking out so you can wire it up, but your control plane is, is the thing where it's easiest to click on because that's how you open up your council connection. And of course I can always work on a building up a management network. That can be something I include, but you know, as, as I said, which is kind of a, the main running theme behind this channel is passing this test. So unfortunately, there are a lot of things I'd love to dive into like management networks and configuring a network kind of more like you would in prod and not, not as much as you would in the lab. But unfortunately, those concepts aren't going to be really emphasized on the exam. And the exam is really what this is all about. It's the main theme behind this channel is passing an expert level networking exam, which I have yet to do. Juniper is kind of, I think, going to be a little bit harder to pass than the Cisco CCIE. 
And that's just because you can see all of the hoops I need to jump through to just have a working lab. Really, if you're using Cisco images with GNS3, everything works really nice and smooth. There's, there's really no issues and you can dive in and study and practice as much as you want without having to go through all these extra steps. But I mean, there's just something fun about using Junipers and it kind of puts you in a different category too. Like, you know, you're working with a, on a team of CCIEs and you might get imposter system, imposter syndrome and think, oh, you know, what am I gonna do here that my coworkers can't do? They're all so much more qualified for me. Do I even belong here? Well, if you've got some experience with junipers, even just in the lab, and none of your coworkers do, even though they're all smarter than you, you kind of have a little bit of a advantage because you can be a lot more comfortable on this device. You've just got more experience. I find a lot of the times your innate intelligence really isn't as important as your kind of learned, hard fought victories. Really the effort you put in into growing and, and getting better is, is going to go a much longer way than your innate abilities. All right, so looks like these are all port channels too, which, which is good, like having port channel experience is always going to be nice. Oops, and it looks like there's a kind of got a little bit ahead of myself because the actual lab is just going to be AS17 with three routers. So I kind of didn't need to set up that whole lab. But I did and it'll be up during the next video when I just read that. But then unfortunately, at the end of the next video, I will need to set up the lab again in order for it to be compatible with the next exercise. So until then, stay tuned until then, more good content to get come. Thanks for watching.